Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Warm welcome to each and every one of you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We welcome you this morning to the morning worship service at Emmanuel Baptist Church. So glad to see a good crowd out this morning and many of you that we haven't seen for quite a while. So thankful to see you here this morning. If you're visiting, we trust that the Lord will just bless you and just morning would be a real time of encouragement for you. And for those of you that are watching online, we, we trust that... Uh, uh, the, the Lord will meet your needs. <clears throat> Wonderful day today. I also uh, want to say uh, a hearty thank you to the church family for uh, the work day or the, the spring clean week and day. That was a real blessing. Tremendous amount of work was done this past week and yesterday. And uh, the, the grounds and the buildings are looking ship shape and nice and clean. And I took a whole bunch of photos and I sent them to pastor and he was uh, so pleased, and he sends his, his, he says, thank you so much. I did speak with Pastor yesterday, briefly, yesterday afternoon. He uh, sends his greetings. He and Donna send their greetings and love to the church. They, uh, he, Pastor continues to uh, improve uh, slowly. He still, he still, has, a, uh, is still t uh, has oxygen, but he is improving, and he's very much looking forward to next Sunday, uh, to Easter Sunday. And um, he's going to be, I just want to set forth the expectations for folks is that a uh, pastor will probably be speaking from a chair and a little desk up here. I just want you to know that and remind you that he's been home fewer days than he ha was in the hospital and rehab. So he's I just want you to understand he's looking great and improving and doing really well, but um, he's not 100 percent yet. So and um, Speaking of that, um, he's going to have, when he's here, he will probably have, uh, he'll probably speak for a, a limited time uh, and probably have limited exposure to the folks, you know, just because uh, he's still recovering and he needs to maintain his health. And as, as much as Pastor would love to hug you <laughs> and you want to hug Pastor, probably that would not be a wise thing to do. So just want to kind of put that out there. We uh, are so thankful for our dear friend, Pastor Arrowwood, and his wife, Dolly. Uh, the, so, we are so thankful that the Lord and His providence and sovereign will have made them available to be able to, uh, to serve uh, uh, here at Emmanuel Baptist Church during our time of uh, testing. And uh, so thankful for their, uh, the, the good word that's been preached and uh, Pastor's heart, Pastor Arrowwood's heart, and... and um, they have become good friends of Emmanuel Baptist Church. And I don't think this will be the last time that we're going to see them, even though this is their last Sunday for a while. So we're looking forward to the Word of God this morning. Um, God has laid something special on Pastor Arrowwood's heart, and we're looking forward to that. Um, be sure, uh, and the Arrowwoods will be with us tonight also. He's not preaching tonight because Dan Hummel, pa uh, Pastor Hummel, uh, not Pastor, Dr. Hummel, and the, the Scripture Assembly team will be here. They'll be presenting tonight, and we'll, 
Uh, you know, the next couple of days, Monday and Tuesday, we'll be putting together, laboring for the Lord to put together some things for the Word of God. But uh, be sure to uh, greet uh, the Arrowwoods and express to them uh, your thanksgiving. So let's, uh, let's stand as we begin our service. We'll ask the Lord's blessing as, we'll, as we uh, commit our worship time to Him. Our Father in Heaven, we thank You, Lord, for this good day that You've given to us. Thank You, Lord, for it being Sunday, first day of the week. It's a reminder, Lord, of the resurrection, that we celebrate the resurrection every Sunday. And thankful, Lord, that we serve a, a risen Savior. Otherwise, this would be all vanity, Lord, if it wasn't, wasn't for the fact that Christ rose again the third day. And our Father, we uh, commit the service to you today. We ask your richest blessing upon it. We ask for every heart uh, that's represented, every person that's hearing, listening, participating, Lord, that uh, uh, you would uh, discern our thoughts and intents and encourage us, Lord, in the things we need encouragement and, and meet our needs. And Lord, we pray that you would be well pleased uh, with the worship this morning. We thank you for uh, Pastor Robert and the good progress that you're making in healing his body and his recovery. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to do that good work. And we pray, Lord, for him uh, as he prepares for next Sunday, the Sunday services and, and uh, the, the Easter service and the morning service. We pray, Father, that uh, that, that would just be a, a special, a real special uh, time. And uh, again, thank you for the Arrowwoods, Pastor Arrowwood and Dolly. Ask your, your blessing upon the word as it goes forth this morning. And, and uh, we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, if you're glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning, say amen. amen. I'm glad to be here. And it's good to see you. And I've seen some new faces here in our, in our service this morning. We're so glad that you're here. And uh, we hope that you make yourself at home and uh, we're so glad to have you. And uh, I want to reiterate some things that Brother Mike just mentioned. He mentioned our, our spring clean yesterday, and that was a wonderful time. And uh, I, was telling, I was telling somebody yesterday, I said, you either learn how well you work with your church or how well you don't work with your church. And, uh, and the group that I was with yesterday, we just had a ball. We, we laughed and we had a great time. And as I floated around and, and other folks were working, and I, I noticed the same thing. And, and uh, it's it's just, and I, and I told this individual, I said, it's great to have a church that enjoys being around each other and is able to work together and get something accomplished for the Lord. And that was encouraging yesterday. But uh, we just don't want to thank those who came out yesterday, but we had people come out all week and, um, and they, they used their time and uh, their effort and really did a great job around this church. And we want to, we want to express our gratitude uh, for you and uh, just uh, the the church looks wonderful as you came in this morning, didn't it? And uh, it's just wonderful. So thank you guys so much. And and we're on to our next project, and that starts uh, officially tonight, but really kicks off tomorrow. And that is our scripture assembly. And I want to encourage you to be here tonight, and uh, be here for whenever Brother Dan Hummel kind of uh, talks about what this ministry is about. And it's a wonderful ministry, being able to put scripture together uh, that's going to be sent around the world for the for the cause of the gospel. Isn't that awesome? And our church has a part of that. And so uh, I'm so excited about that. That will begin um, with Brother Dan Hummel tonight, and we will uh, start working on those uh, Scripture Assembly projects uh, tomorrow uh, afternoon. Now be aware, all right, we don't provide lunch. We have provided lunch in the past, but we're not providing lunch this year. But if you would like to join the church and, and have the church go out and get you something and, and help you in that way, uh, we would be glad to do that. But um, if you would like to just bring your own um, packed lunch that's that's okay too but we all we we will be providing dinner okay for both nights that will be monday night and tuesday night but the thing that we that we require of you that we ask of you is please 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 sign up okay
okay? Uh, it's hard to know who's going to be here and uh, what, how much to prepare for if we don't have an accurate number, okay? And so if you can sign up, that would be great, and that would really help us to, to have enough uh, for the people who are going to be here at those times. That is for Monday evening's dinner and Tuesday evening's dinner. So if you plan on being here or if you think you're going to be here or if you have a question mark or something like that, just sign up anyways. Uh, that will help us in getting the right number. So we're looking forward to that project, and that's going to be a wonderful time for us to work together and uh, realize how well we work together. And so fantastic. I'm excited about Easter. Are you? Amen. And that's going to be a wonderful time. And we are just thrilled about uh, what's going to happen next week and uh, with our pastor being able to be back. You won't want to miss the service at 9 a.m. That's going to be a wonderful service. And then we're going to be able to have uh, a time of fellowship here in the back. And then we're going to come back in. Now, please be aware, we've had uh, services on Easter at 11. We have changed it this year. Okay, it's going to be at 1045. You see the information there in your bulletin. So please uh, note that and be aware of that. And then, of course, we have our revival coming up with both Tom Farrell. That's going to be a wonderful time, too. I hope you came with a heart of worship this morning. And uh, I, I am so excited to see what God is going to do in our lives this morning. Brother Earl, if you would, please come up and lead us in some songs. Stand with me. Where could I go? Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so grateful to be in your house this morning, Lord. We're so thankful that we have times in our life that we need somewhere to go, Lord, for refuge and for a friend, Lord. And we're thankful that we could go to you in those times. Lord, we're thankful to be in your house this morning. We're thankful to be here. And we ask you, Lord, to meet with us, Lord. I, I know there are many things going on in our minds and in our hearts, things that we want to get accomplished this week. Lord, I pray that we would set those things aside. Lord, that we can have a meeting here with you this morning. Lord, I pray that you would be with the music. I pray that you would be with the preaching. And we ask all this in your name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Oh, 
please again wonderful words of life
seated as we sing, I Want That Mountain. Man, wasn't that a blessing? I've been encouraged by the music this morning. I don't know about you. And uh, I'm excited about the preaching time now. We're not just a music church, we're a preaching church. And so it was good to have our friend of our church, not only my friend, but this church's friend, uh, Pastor Rick Arrowwood, uh, with us. And he, I tell you, tomorrow's going to be tough for me and Courtney seeing him go. We love this dear, dear preacher. And uh, we look forward to hearing him preach this morning. Come on, brother. We love you. 
We love you too, Pastor Luke. We've tried to be quiet as church mouse, mice downstairs. Um, I'm the talker. Dolly is the quiet one. If you knew us well, I would tease with her and would say things like, it's been hard to keep her quiet, but it's not hard to keep her quiet. Uh, she's a quiet, spirited lady, and I'm thankful that the Lord gave her to me. We have thoroughly enjoyed our time here. Um, it's hard to say goodbye. You know, this is a, these were unusual times, and, and uh, it's difficult. But we want to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts for everything that you've done uh, for us to make us feel welcome. Uh, I mean, right down to little goodies that uh, people have prepared and, and uh, everything. We've gotten to know some of you personally. Uh, we've exchanged uh, uh, some text along the way. I do want to say last Sunday night, uh, a man came forward and uh, trusted Christ as Savior. They're going to be following up on him. Yesterday, I tell you, this, this church is a biblical church. Yesterday, Brother Reggie preached a funeral, and uh, he cut my hair and gave me a lecture on how to keep it down in the back, <laughs> which I needed. <laughs> you know, you're, you're a captive audience. Are y'all going to be okay with this? Because I'm going to preach this morning a very unusual message. And we're going to end up unusual, so just get ready for it. But this is my last time. And I may go past a little bit of my normal time. So, But I, I want to talk with you from my heart just for a moment. But Re Brother Reggie, if you haven't gone to his bar barbershop, man, please do so. Because before it's over with, in the middle of the cut, he stops and he gets his Bible. And he starts asking a question or starts talking, and then he'll do this. He'll turn the Bible around and put it right under your nose and say, you see this verse right here? I mean, you can't go anywhere. It's worse, than any bad, it's, it's worse than any church service that you'll ever go to. You can't back up. You're sitting down. You can't go anywhere. Uh, it is a delightful... Uh, and I've, we have gotten to know so many of you. Brother Mike, thank you for your kindness and uh, you and Carrie. It's, it's just been a great joy. So Dolly and I, thank you for everything that you've done for us. And we look forward one day, Lord willing, uh, that we'll be able to come back to Emmanuel. Unless he comes and then we'll all meet in heaven. <laughs> and uh, then I want to begin the slideshow by showing you a wonderful picture. Tuesday, Dolly and I went out. Uh, to the Reberts, and we had a great time of fellowship. And we found out that we love the Bible, that we love God's people, that many people that he invites to this pulpit, I have invited over the years I was a pastor to our pulpit, including your evangelist next week, Tom Farrell, who is a great friend of ours. And uh, I'm going to call him this week to tell him I was here before him. <laughs> uh, and uh, tell him that uh, he, he will enjoy his time here. So we had a wonderful visit, and Miss Robert uh, made us a little snack, and, and we had time at the table. We stayed for about an hour and a half. I felt like we might have overstayed our, our, our time, but uh, he was tired. So when he comes next week to preach, give him whatever space he needs to get in and out as quickly as possible. And I know you're going to know that you're going to want to, uh, to speak to him. And uh, <clears throat> in some ways, you'll be able to do that even today at the end of the service. So take your Bibles, if you would, please, and find uh, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. "'Twas battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it scarcely worth his while to waste much time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile." What a bid, good friend of mine. Who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar, one dollar, then two, only two, two dollars, and who'll make it three? Three dollars going, but no, from the room far back, an old gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. And wiping the dust off the old violin and tightening its loosened strings, why, he played a melody pure and sweet, sweet as a caroling angel sings. The music ceased. And the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, What do I bid now for this old violin? As he held it up with its bow. A thousand dollars, and who'll make it two? Two thousand, and who'll make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice. Going and gone, cried he. 
the people cheered. But some of them cried, we do not understand. What changed its worth? And quick came the reply, "'Twas the touch of the master's hand. And many a men with life out of tune that's battered and scarred in sin are auctioned cheap to that thoughtless crowd, much like that old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a song, and he travels on. He's going once, he's going twice, he's, he's almost gone. Ah, but the dear master comes. And the foolish crowd can never quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that's wrought by the touch of the master's hand. If you have had that touch of the master's hand and been born again by the power of the gospel, you will be able to identify with the character in which I want to spend some time with this morning. He's not known. Very few sermons I've ever heard about his life. His name is hard to pronounce, much less spell. Most people do not know who he is. He never pastored. He was, he was just a church member who loved his church and who loved his pastor. And as God began to put this message on my mind, I thought about you guys and the relationship that you have had with your pastor over the last several months, how you've been away from him and how much you love him. I have seen that in your eyes. I've heard it on your voices as we speak. Paul, as you well know, is the author, human author of this book. He was born about the time of Christ was, between 3 and 5 A.D. For three years, after he spent 10 years from the age of 15 to 25, he studied un under the tutelage of Gamaliel. He was one of two. Hillel was the other great rabbis in his time that people could study under. The people in Taurus saw something special in Saul and encouraged his parents to send him, and they did. And for 10 years, then he spent the next three years persecuting all of the followers of Jesus Christ that he could. He was Saul of Tarsus. He was a man that shed blood. He was there in Acts chapter 7, shortly after the church began, as he held the cloaks of those who stoned Stephen, the first martyr of the church. And then at the age of 28, he was literally touched by the master's hand. On the road to Damascus, he got saved. And from age 31 to 41, after spending three years in Arabian desert, he preaches in all the surrounding regions of his home area. At the age of 42, he took his first missionary journey with Barnabas, and they set sail to Cyprus and later into the region of Galatia. The first missionary endeavor lasted a little over a year, and then there was a second missionary journey. And at the age of 44, he takes that journey, and here with him he takes Silas, and there he, they go through Asia Minor. And at Troas, when he got in the northern part of that region, close to the Aegean Sea, at Troas, he received the Macedonian call, and that changed his life. You remember it there in the book of Acts. Come over and help us. And he did. He obeyed God's call. Oh, how we need people to obey the call of God in their lives when God calls them into service. How we need young people and older people to be missionaries all around the world. You will have an opportunity to be a missionary for about three days, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, as you put these scriptures together. What a great opportunity. It was in this town that he met our character. He met a man <clears throat> that came to hear him preach. His name was Epaphroditus. And he got saved. And salvation changed his thinking about everything, changed his thinking about his life, changed his thinking about the church who, that he had heard of, changed his thinking about God. He was a pagan when he got saved. 
And his whole life changed. It opened up a new avenue of service for him. And then one day he had to say goodbye to the apostle that led him to Christ. And at the age of 47, Paul takes his third missionary journey. At age 53, he returns to Jerusalem for a couple of years, and then he is arrested and put in prison in Caesarea by the sea. If you've ever been to the Bible lands, you've probably stood in that great theater that overlooks the Mediterranean Sea where Herod was eaten with worms. It was there Paul was imprisoned. And then around the age 59, he appears before Festus and appeals to Caesar for his own life and then sets sails to Rome. He did not know it, but that would be his last voyage. And after being under house arrest for three years and penning several books of the Bible we call the prison epistles, Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon, he took time to also pen the pastoral epistles, three of my favorite books of the New Testament, uh, First and Second Timothy and Titus. And at 65, he returns under the hand of Nero, and in, eight, and in AD 69, he was martyred. So he's born around the same time of Jesus. At 28, he gets saved, begins serving and preaching immediately. Epaphroditus meets him and spends the last 20 years of Paul's ministry with him. He greatly influenced his life. No other character in the New Testament does Paul speak such terms of endearment than Epaphroditus. And when we look at it, when we unfold this text, we will see just how important relationships of a church member to their church, to the people in their church, and to their pastor really is. It's an amazing text. And Paul loves Epaphroditus, and Epaphroditus loves Paul. My proposition to you this morning is simple. When we are saved, we are commanded to be faithful to our local church. That's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 and to serve in our local church. We are saved to serve. And that's Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. No one gets a pass, regardless of how old you are or regardless of how, what health you're in. None of that matters. There's always a way in which you can exercise your gift right down to daily prayer, praying for your church. This service, and I, I want to captivate this because we're going to come back to it at the end of the message. This service, this kind of service to your local church can become so personal that some measure of sacrifice will become evident in your relationship with your pastor. So that brings us to our text, beginning in verse 25 of chapter 2. Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick, nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Do you see how close these two men were? Paul is writing from a Roman prison. And he is not saying, I'm sorrowful because I'm in prison. He's sorrowful because he couldn't be with people. And he says, it would have been sorrow upon sorrow if one of my most precious friends in the ministry, who stuck with me for 20 years nearly, if he would have died of that sickness, it would have added great sorrow to my sorrow. And when Epaphroditus did visit him in prison, notice verse 28. I sent him therefore the more carefully that when ye see him again, now watch it carefully. Ye may rejoice, and then I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such 
in reputation. Honor the unsung hero. That's what Paul was commanding this church to do. Because of his love for the work of Christ, because of his love for the church, and because of his love for his pastor. Look at verse 30. Because for the work of Christ he was nigh to death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward me. Father, help us in the message this morning, simple as it is, and yet, Lord, your word is so powerful. It will remind us of just what kind of church member we need to be as we are in the work of Christ here at Emmanuel. Lord, if there's someone here that does not know Christ as Savior, may this be the last time they will ever hear a gospel message and stay in their seat, but they would be willing to come forward in the invitation and surrender and give their lives to you. Work in hearts, every saved church member in this room and watching by YouTube, I ask, Lord, that you would work in all of our hearts. And we'll thank you for it. In Christ's name, amen. Let me tell you a few things about Epaphroditus. He was a unique man. His name was not uncommon, by the way, in the first century, especially among Romans. His name, given to him by his pagan parents, he was named after a sensual temple deity a pagan. His name means lovely or handsome. Obviously, his parents were thinking about him being like a god that they were worshiping when they named him. Epaphroditus is only mentioned twice in the New Testament, and that's in this book, in chapter 2 and in chapter 4. The only one at Philippi who became a beloved friend to the Apostle Paul that we know of in Scripture. I believe there are a lot of people like him in the New Testament. Now, the fact of the matter is, he devoted himself to the work of Christ, and he, he was sick unto death. He, he was indefatigable. You, you couldn't wear him out. He just kept going and going and going. And he got so sick, he nearly died. And the fact of the matter is, when he recovered, Paul sent him back to Philippi, and with this epistle, so that it could be read, and that it would quiet their spirit, because the church loved Epaphroditus, and they knew he was sick. They were worried about him. Matter of fact, our text said Epaphroditus was so selfless that he was more worried about what people thought about his sickness than he was himself. Boy, we get that wrong, don't we? I mean, we miss one Sunday if pastor don't come knock and call him. We wonder what's going on. It's not that way with Epaphroditus. What a great church member he was. He lived in Philippi. Let me just remind you, it was a Roman colony. It was really developed after it was founded in 42 BC. It was really developed by Caesar. Wealthy dignitaries lived there because it was a Roman outpost and, and because it would be like a little Washington DC. And the church became known for its outstanding character. These dignitaries, as well as servants and slaves, began to get saved. And all of them came to the same church. That, that's why the church is wonderful. All, out of all walks of life, God gives us an ecclesia, an assembly. And so this church, much like this church, and all local churches, they become known for certain things. This church became known for their joy. That was the theme of the book. They also became known for their love for each other. That was the testimony of the book. And they were known for their missionary vision. That was the heart of the book. And, and their unity showed their attitude of the book. Matter of fact, their unity was a result of their joy and their love and their missionary vision. That's what brings a church together in unity, those things. I wish I had time to share that with you from Scripture. But Paul writes to this church, look back in verse 29, and let me establish you the purpose of this message. The Bible says, uh, Paul writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, receive him, giving this church instructions, 
That means to accept by giving access. Matter of fact, this word receive is an intimate term. The picture is the coming together of a husband and a wife. That's how intimate it is. Receive him and then therefore in the Lord. So receiving him is personal and receiving him in the Lord is spiritual. With all gladness, cheerfulness, and great delight, that's with emotion, and hold such or adhere to or cling to, there's a physical aspect of their relationship. In reputation, honor the hero, there's an honorable relationship. And so the title of this message, Epaphroditus, the unsung hero, Paul is using an example in Holy Writ to give us this precious narrative that helps us get our minds around what church should look like and how I fit in. Fitly joined together, Paul said to the church at Ephesus. Well, there are three short, simple things I want to, us to see. Number one, I want us to see his relationship with Paul, his pastor. And then his relationship with the people of the church. And then his relationship with the purpose and plan of God for his life. His relationship, first and foremost, was with his pastor. And Paul uses four precious terms that he talks about this man. Nowhere else in the New Testament, including Timothy, does he speak in such terms. The first one is in relationship to their salvation. And that's important for us to know. Notice he calls him my brother. That's the first one. Look there in verse a, or verse uh, 25a. Delphus is the Greek word. We get our word Philadelphia. Uh, actually, Delphus is the Greek word that refers to a mother's womb. Paul was saying, this man Epaphroditus is my brother. Now, they were not blood brothers. Paul was a Jew. Epaphroditus was a Gentile. But he used such terms that when those people in that first century church heard him use the term Delphus, they knew that these two men were extremely close. They literally loved each other in Christ in such unusual ways. And he refers to his relationship of being one closer than a blood brother. And then not only <clears throat> salvation is mentioned, but a relationship of strength. And before I go here, let me say this to you. Each one of these are exponential in value. In other words, you can't have the second one without the first one. You can't have the third one without the first and second one. You can't have the fourth one without the first, second, and third one. In other words, they build upon each other. You cannot be a companion in labor if you're not a brother. You got to be a brother. You got to be saved. And if you heard the lesson and if you've been hearing Brother Mike's lessons, and I, I, I recommend that after you hear this book of Hebrews taught by him, you ought to get three hours worth of seminary credit for it because he's teaching you the word of God. It was excellent again this morning. Brother, he spoke about it. not someone caught up in religion, not someone caught up in, in some organization but the church of the living God. And he, they became a companion in labor. In other words, <clears throat> literally, Epaphroditus became an assistant to Paul, just assisting him, not in preaching. Nowhere will you find a message that he ever preached. He was a church member who said, Paul, I want to help you. I want to come alongside. When I can travel with you, I will. When Paul was in prison, he not only was his assistant, he was his attendant. He went to his aid. We'll find him in this text taking an offering and his, his personal goods to him. Epaphroditus is an amazing man who had a good relationship with his pastor. And Paul speaks of it. And then there's the relationship of suffering. It's one thing to be a brother. It's another thing to be a companion in labor. But what if hard times comes? When the battles come. And we are in a battle, are we not? Battles do come. And now there's suffering. 
He's my fellow soldier. This denotes that there were battles that they were fighting. And we know there were persecution. There were plagues, pestilences. We know there were uprisings. We know they were arresting Paul everywhere they could get him, backing him in a corner. I mean, it was, this was risky. But he didn't look at the risk, even to his own health. Not that I'm preaching that you ought to break your health for the church. That's not what the text is teaching, and that's certainly not what I'm teaching. But we have an example, even of, his, of, of how he may not should have worked so assiduously in his life. Maybe he should have taken more breaks. Maybe he should have said no more often. But there were spiritual battles, and there were, we know there were moral battles in that day, and personal battles, and leadership battles. And, and being in the battle for the Lord, you, you have to be loyal first and foremost, not to a man, but to the Word of God. And when you're loyal to the Word of God, and your pastor is loyal to the Word of God, you overlook his idiosyncrasies, and you love him. And you work with him. Uncle Bud Robinson, that famous Nazarene evangelist, tells the story of when he's a kid, they pushed a hay wagon over the brink of the hill. Um, and they, his friends got on it, and they just kids, and said, hang on, don't anyone jump off. And they got going down the hill, and it started floating toward the briar patch. And all of a sudden, they realized they were going to go through the briar patch, and some of them were jumping off. And, and, and Uncle Bud Robinson dug his fingernails in and uh, stayed on, and a few others did. When they got through the briar patch, Uncle Bud Robinson told the story, and he says, what we need today is church members with some buckboard underneath their fingernails. That don't run when the first problem comes, but yet stays. There's battles. He is my brother. He is my companion in labor. He is my fellow soldier. But notice one more thing quickly. A relationship of serving. He that ministered to my wants. The word minister here describes someone who would work in the temple. And wants does not mean the lavish desires of Paul, but rather the daily necessities to allow life to exist. That's why they took to him, Epaphroditus did some personal items, his cloak, the parch parchments, the offering that this church took up. And so like a good Samaritan, sometimes laboring with each other, I know we're in a pandemic, but sometimes it does involve literally touching the, the, the greatest example of this in the New Testament would be in Luke chapter 10, when the Good Samaritan took into his hands the man in the ditch and bound up his wounds and poured in oil and took care of him. It, it took some tender touching physically. So their relationship had to do with their conversion and their closeness and their contending for the faith when it came time to, and compassion one toward another. But see with me secondly and quickly his relationship with the people of the church. He was their sent one. Look at verse 25, the D part of that verse. Your messenger. The word messenger is our word in the New Testament for apostle. He wasn't an apostle as Paul was, but he was an ambassador. That's the idea. He was their sent one. And he was selfless. Look at verse 26. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. Epaphroditus was more concerned that others knew of his sickness than he was his own sickness. And then <clears throat> he was willing to sacrifice. And I want you to see this. Keep your finger here and just flip over to the fourth chapter. He was willing to sacrifice. And he was the one <clears throat> that one day stood in the church and volunteered. Now here's what happened in the church of Philippi. An offering was taken. And the pastor got up and said, our dear brother Paul is in prison in Rome, and he needs this offering. He needs some personal uh, items, uh, and we need someone that will take this offering to him. And sick in body, immediately Epaphroditus stands to his feet, and he says, Pastor, I'll be happy to do that. And so he does. And Epaphroditus travels probably on foot some 1,300 miles to take that offering as he traveled up through Southern Europe and then turned and came back down into the boot of Italy to the Western shore, to the Roman prison. 
Look at verse 15. But I have received all and abound. All means everything that he brought. Those needs, those wants, those necessities of life, the, the offering. I have received all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you. Now watch what he called them. An odor of a sweet smell. A sacrifice, acceptable, well-pleasing. These were sacrificial gifts. Obviously. So you see what I mean by my prop proposition to you? Your service can become so personal that by some measure, your sacrifice will be seen toward your church, toward the Lord's work, and even toward your pastor. Not that you worship him, but you are thankful for God calling him. Thirdly and quickly, his relationship with the purpose of his Savior. Look at verse 30. Because for the work of Christ, and I emphasize that, underscore it in your Bible, he was nigh unto death. Because of the work of Christ, what was the work of Christ? Winning souls, building churches, and giving to missionaries and discipling so that they, those disciples can win souls, so they can build churches, have more missionaries surrender so that they would see them saved and baptized and discipled and saved and baptized and discipled. We can't, listen, we can never quit reaching a first generation person for the Lord Jesus Christ. If the church is going to survive 10, 15, and 20 years from now, we must be so winning. Amen. We must be telling others about Christ. Churches, in my 42, 43 years of ministry, I have seen them start and they're no longer. They got more interested in programs than God's program. They built huge churches only to fill them quickly. And then all of a sudden, only a handful of people. Mushroom growth is never good because when all the mush leaves, all you have left is room. Can't grow a church that way. You grow a church by soul winning and, and teaching them the importance of obeying the Lord in baptism and discipling them so that they can go out and win souls. And somewhere along the line, guess what's going to happen? Someone's going to say, God's called me to the mission field. And we get all happy about that, do we not? We send them off to Christian college and we get them to the mission field and that's the way it should be. And I have a tremendous burden that this is not the way the church is going today. And it's hurting us overall. We have just read Epaphroditus' epitaph. Zoni's gravestone in our minds and hearts. He was my brother. He was my companion in labor. He was my fellow soldier. He was my minister. Paul was his pastor, but he ministered to Paul. What epitaph would Pastor Robert write of you? One day, if the Lord doesn't come, you're going to die and he most likely will stand over and, and say something about you. What will he say? What kind of testimony will you have lived Sobering, isn't it? We want to be like the two ladies in chapter 4 who couldn't agree on the same thing. Unity was so important. How do others see you in the church? Are you selfish or selfless? Is it all about you or is it about others? Are you a servant leader? Some people say, we shouldn't, we shouldn't put those two terms together. We'll have some wimpy leaders. Oh, no. No, no, no. Servant leadership is needed today. And so, my proposition to you, if I can get personal, will you allow me to do that this morning? I feel like I know you well enough. I can get a little personal. So, I call this 
the Emmanuel Baptist Church proposition. And I want to encourage you about something. Your service at Emmanuel can become so personal that some measure of sacrifice will become evident in your relationship with Pastor and Mrs. Robert because they love you. I saw that in their home when we visited. You have a wonderful church here. And I know you know that. And you've got wonderful people in this church. And I know you love each other. I've watched you do it. And I, I watched people come yesterday and work. I, I got under conviction. I felt like I should have been out there with them. And I know you know these things. I know you're well taught. But I thought about <clears throat> how we could express our love to Pastor Robert. You'll be coming back, Lord willing, next week to preach for the first time in months since December. So the invitation is going to be in two parts. Number one, I'm going to give every unsaved person here an opportunity who heard the gospel to come forward and let us take a Bible and show you how you can be saved. That's going to be the first part of the invitation. The second part of the invitation, for those of you who would like to, to line up down this aisle here and come to this microphone, and the camera will be on you, and you will be able to speak to Pastor Mrs. Rebert personally. It can just be a statement or two. We love you. Thank you for obeying the call. We miss you. Whatever you want to say, thank you for leading me to Christ. Thank you for baptizing me. Thank you, Ms. Rebert, for teaching the ladies, working on the bus routes. Being a, a godly example of a godly pastor's wife, this, is, this will be your opportunity in just a moment. So would you stand with me, please, with heads bowed and eyes closed. The pianist is going to come and begin the invitation hymn. If you are here and you do not know Christ as Savior, you have heard the gospel proclaimed from this pulpit maybe more than once, but you heard it today. Christ died for sinners. Paul preached the gospel and Epaphroditus and scores and hundreds and thousands of others got saved. Wouldn't it be your time to be saved today? Oh, I beg you, please come. Let us take the Bible and show you how you can be saved. This stanza, this first stanza is for you, dear lost friends. Please come. Step from your place and come. We're here to help you. here. I want you to know that. It's never closed. We can always help you even after the service. As he continues playing, and you want to look into the camera and speak, would you just start lining up down this aisle here, and we just make a circle. That way you won't have any head on collision. Just step from your place and come right now. Deacons could come, Sunday school teachers, those who labor and work. Come down this aisle. Don't be shy. This is your time to say something personal to Pastor Ms. Robert. That's right. Step from your place. Plenty of, plenty of opportunity here. He'll continue playing softly in the background. And Brother Mike will be the first one. And just step, get, get right in front of the mic, if you would, so you can be heard. Turn it, turn that mic. Thank the Lord for you and looking forward to seeing you next Sunday. Amen. Pastor and Donna, we've missed you. We look forward to you coming back. Pastor, we know that there's great things in store for Emmanuel, and we're looking forward to your return. Amen. We have had faith in God, and we trust that you have been so encouraged just seeing these people today. We look forward to seeing you next week. Be sure you get right in front of the microphone so we can hear you. Hi, Pastor and Donna. Thank you so much for making me a part of your Emmanuel family. Wow. I love my church friends, and 
those that I know and those that I don't. Thank you again. Be well. Amen. Sweet. Good morning, Pastor Donna. I want to thank you all for your service. Pastor, I want to thank you especially for your walk with the Lord and your friendship through the years. God bless. Amen. Pastor, you know that Carl and I love you, and God loves you even more than we do. Thank you for being faithful and being the servant that God could trust to walk this road that you've been on. Donna, thank you for your love and your friendship. I can't wait to see you next week. Pastor and Mrs. Reverend, we want to thank you for uh, your many years of service here. Thank you for all the times that you've prayed for us as a family. Lord, uh, we're, we're grateful for that. Uh, we look forward to seeing you guys next week. Very excited about that. Thank you. Amen. Pastor and Donna, we, uh, we just want to say we love you, and I thank you for uh, your leading in my life. I thank you for teaching me the importance of prayer, and I thank you for helping me grow in Christ. Love you. Hi, Pastor and Donna. Um, I'm just really looking forward to seeing you next week. It's been a long journey for you, and um, we just love you and support you. And I just thank you for all the help that uh, being my, the shepherd in my life. And uh, we see you next week. Uh, Pastor and Miss Donna, thank you uh, for the labor that you put into me and to my wife. I thank you for your testimony and your faithfulness, and uh, we look forward to having you back. Good morning, Pastor. Pastor, first of all, I want to thank you for being a friend to me and our family. Just the example that you are here at the church, Lord. It's obvious the Lord is working in your life and has been, and we just thank you and love you. Look forward to seeing you next week. Pastor, I just want to say to you and Donna, um, we love you. Uh, thank you from our family to you. The, the, the many helps that you give us in junior church, uh, and we just, we love you so much. We want to see you next Sunday. Thank you. Good morning, Pastor and Donna. Pastor, I just want to say thank you for the Wild Game Dinner outreach that brought me here in 2000. And uh, January 19th of 2000, uh, leading me to the Lord in a little room back here behind the pulpit. And the uh, Lord's changed my life, and you have uh, certainly played a big part in that. We love you. Bye. Hello, Pastor and Mrs. Revert. I just wanted to say, I have my whole family, you know, really, really miss you guys. You know, we love coming to this church. We really miss you guys. And, you know, we're looking, really looking forward to seeing you guys next week for Easter, Lord willing. And God bless. Anyone else want to get in line, you can. Hey, preacher. Uh, I think we're all excited to, to get our pastor back next week. Uh, I'm particularly excited uh, that my friend's coming back next week as well. So we look forward to having you back. We are super excited to see you next week, and we are looking forward to it. Thank you for the friendship that you've given my family and for leading us in. Even though we joined uh, just about four years ago, you were going through cancer and just watching you praise God and live for him. And you're doing the same thing, and we appreciate it. We love you guys. Hi, Pastor and Donna. Um, we'd like to thank you for all you've done, and we, we, all our prayers have been answered that you're still here. We need you here, and you're doing a great job. Keep it up. We need time to get in line if you want to. Thank you, Pastor, for everything you've done. And this is a God's way of <coughs> telling us all that there is a God and He can heal. Amen. We thank you and we love you. We'll see you next Sunday. God bless you. Hi, Pastor and Miss Donna. Daniel and I love you. The girls and I love you. 
and we just wanted to give our well wishes to you. We're so thankful for God to answer prayer, and our hearts have been with you the entire time. Amen. <clears throat> it's a blessing. We have, uh, we're, we have been blessed at Emmanuel Baptist Church. Um, and one of the things that we've been blessed by, it's highly unusual, is that we have uh, a pastor and his wife who labor for 35 plus years in one assembly. They poured their life into us. And uh, really, uh, really a blessed, blessed assembly. So, well, on that note, let's, uh, let's pray and, and uh, we'll be dismissed in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. Lord, we really have so much to praise you for. And uh, we do thank you, Lord, for uh, Pastor and uh, Donna. Thank you, Lord, for their family. And thank you, Lord, for their sacrifice, their labor of love. Lord, we thank you that the scripture tells us that you are not unfaithful to remember our uh, work and labor of love. And, and we thank you, Lord, for how you've called them and brought them to Winchester, Virginia, and, and how you've used them in hundreds of lives, Lord. You've uh, used them to be a, a light and a testimony and to uh, teach and to uh, bring uh, the saints along to grow. And our Father, we thank you for the good work that you've done in their lives. And we thank you for, again, for sparing our pastor's life and uh, uh, restoring his health. And we pray, Lord, that that would continue. Pray, Lord, that you... Continue to restore him to full health, that that be thy will. And we pray, Father, for uh, your blessing on, uh, as we look forward to Easter Sunday, we look forward to, the, to their return. And uh, we pray you dismiss us with your blessing, bring us back this evening, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.